and things happen and change the world. So um, he started uh, at Harvard and MIT, uh, Harvard Med School, and um, uh, he was there from 87 to 95. And I think at some point he told me that he felt like he couldn't do all the things he wanted to do to change the world there. So then he went to Seattle with Lee Hartwell to uh, start the Rosetta um, Rosetta Info, Info, Informatics, and um, they, from there on, he went to Mark and he was the VP of Cancer Research, the drug uh, program uh, there. And but that seemed like it wasn't uh, also big enough, somehow constraining to Stephen. So he started Sage Bio Networks, and Sage Bio Networks was, was is uh, an incredible company which. Um, enables a lot of crowdsourcing ideas. So it's a, somehow a platform uh, for, um, for enable, enabling a lot of computational challenges in uh, computational me medicine and computational biology. And um, that I, just let me remind you that Steve was trained as an oncologist. So that's, that's the kind of company uh, that he started, that's, that's the kind of thinking that he has. Uh, from there, uh, uh, the founders, the board uh, chair, he went on to Apple. And at Apple, he was um, uh, working on the new ideas for the new health uh, division that they had. And as of November 17, if I'm not mistaken, he uh, left Apple because Apple is not big enough to. Um, <laughs> to start, this is just my own interpretation, uh, um, to, to start something new, something new and exciting, and I think he will talk about it today. Thank you. Well, not big enough, I don't know. I might put that back in the box, but otherwise, <laughs> um, very nice. Nice, nice to, to be here. I think I'm on this. Yeah. Um, and um, so uh, you saw the, the title today. Um, I want to go over a, a, a couple of themes that um, hopefully will bring up a dialogue at the end. Um, these are the assumptions that I want to go over. Um, I spent the last two years, as you heard, at Apple. And there, it's uh, possible to have both insights into engineers and who wants to do what inside. But it's also an amazing place to be able to look at all the groups who said, I have an app that can do this and this and this and this and this. There are about a thousand plus of these out there. And I want to go over a little bit about um, where that hype is surrounding those. Um, I'm interested in, in asking questions about, because this talk is going to be mostly about how individuals can navigate their life uh, between health and disease. It's about how can we make those predictions. Um, it's about if you can make those predictions, how is someone possibly going to be able to, to, to use it, uh, to work with that? And so um, I uh, hope that this description of the project that I'm going to say is the first uh, time I've uh, also put out there. This is what I'm interested in working on. And uh, I'm hoping to get some feedback on, on, uh, for, from you on, on where it could go. Um, unlike music, um, where there's an industry that needs to be changed, um, health has a remarkably very fractal-like description depending upon who you're talking to. So health is not something where you can say, I want to do this with health. Or something. It means something very different to, depending upon whether you are a patient or whether you're a researcher or whether you're a clinician, et cetera, government official, things like that. Um, somewhere at the center, obviously, is some element of, of absence of disease, but I don't want to wax poetic. Um, I think you know it when you see it. Um, when, when you see someone able to do what they want to in their life, you can feel and can see that uh, when someone is in, in a position of health. And also, sometimes, 
there's a person uh, who has actually figured out how to have that sense of health bounded in some ways by things that normally would say are heart disease. So, so I think that, that sense is there. Um, but this is what the talk is about. Uh, most of us uh, certainly um, spend most of our diet, uh, lives uh, sort of going, that's something I'm so glad I don't have to think about. Mm -hmm. Leave me alone, right? I'm into my own self, I'm into my own world. And all that time when we're so consumed by our devices, we're actually going off track, <laughs> coming back, going off track, coming back in a way that we, that we aren't aware of. So, so there's some sort of combination of denial, ignorance, and, and, and just because we get driven by things we love, by what we're doing. And, uh, and, I, and I'm interested in, in that problem. Um, I'm also interested in the fact that, um, unlike engineering, um, unlike like most of the things in our lives, we as individuals tolerate being told um, by experts that um, I want to give you this, I want you to try this uh, treatment, but instead of saying, it's got a 95% chance of working, um, I know that this is the right thing for you to do, we tolerate um, what happens when you take everyone put them into a, a bin and you say, you must be in this category and for this category I can tell you this fact. So there's a, a serious uh, problem in the way that we um, give our treatments, design our, our therapies, and tolerate whether it's a quarter, whether it's a third of the time, so sort of failure, and just say, well, it's, it's medicine. It, that's, that, that's what it's gonna be, um, that, that's the way it is. Particularly over the last uh, a couple of years, I noticed another fallacy or, or issue, which is that a lot of scientists think that medicine is a hard science. That it, we, we, we just have to, dis, you know, we're, we're close to considering it a hard science. And sort of like the wiring diagram on this 1940 uh, Lincoln Zephyr, you know, once we get the parts, we'll know what to do. And um, I think we need to pause and think about the gap between how it's a hard science and the reality that comes about from the complexity of what we're trying to solve where it really shouldn't be considered as, as a hard science. Um, that hard, that, 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 and the medical world can be held accountable, as a physician I feel like I can say this, for giving description of what one should do, directions, by building recipes. So sometimes these recipes are called randomized clinical trials. But what they basically are is, I'm gonna put this together, I'm gonna to look at a bunch of people, and this happened to them, therefore follow these instructions. Okay. That isn't science per se. That, that, that is, I found this to be true in this particular context. And so uh, what happened to me during my uh, pediatric training was I was told for the first half of my residency, tell those mothers, you've gotta put your kid on the stomach uh, this is the right thing to do, you tell them that this is why, and then in the middle of it, this paper comes up and goes, oh, no, 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 we now know what you need to do is put your babies on the back. This is what you should do, because some recipe came out and said, this is what you should do. <coughs> I don't know whether anyone is pregnant or knows uh, people who are, but now the new thing that's gonna come in this year is on the side. Sometimes I just wonder it's because someone took a whole study, designed it to get credit, to be able to put something out there, and we just sort of go drop it in, okay, to on side, we're gonna do. And, and I'm, I'm doing this on purpose because it's about that uh, um, evidence base. That, that's my point. Is don't think of it as hard truths. It's, it's a moderately amalgamated uh, sort of descriptions of, of, of what should be done. And then uh, the next to last issue is that um, when we get sick, uh, often for good reasons, there's a bargain that we strike uh, which says, um, I'm sick heal me, and in return for that, I give you my agency. Um, uh, you tell me what to do, I will follow your orders. I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm gonna go on faith mode. Right? So, so even in this 21st century, we go on faith mode that, that says, I don't have to know why it is, I don't know what's there, but in return for healing me, I'm gonna follow your, your orders, which is one of the things I'm most worried about in terms of what happens when you take agency and being a part of that process, particularly in less severe things when you're trying to navigate. Um, it's this uh, asymmetry between who is the person who's sick and who it is that is the, the, the expert. And uh, the, the last component is just um, a lot of the other issues come about by a very uh, uh, sort of pragmatic or real thing, which is we've been uh, people, meaning we, whether it's a 
patient, whether it is a physician, et cetera, um, into you're well or you're sick. As if there's this transition state that happens. You're either sick or you're well. And a lot of the trying to understand disease, I think, is held up by the way you say, these people have type 2 diabetes, or these people have arthritis. And it's the binary nature of that and that, that uh, automatic transition state. So um, just as a review uh, where it is, a combination of uh, misassessments and end care, um, this, this concept of uh, you know, these, these sort of strange poor, poor recipes, who gets to exclusively do it, and, and some elements of um, the unlinked to the digital world, binary measures, this, this is reality. So um, now to who's doing what to make this different? Or who's out there that's making uh, good contributions? Um, how can digital uh, devices, et cetera, um, uh, impact this at all? Um, so um, there are lots of efforts. Um, I have to say that I was lucky this morning to spend uh, some time with uh, Joe and the e-health uh, efforts uh, here, and I didn't know anything about it, so I'm trying to figure out, are these exceptions that uh, blow up some ideas of what are in current? But the, the point I want to make here is that lots of groups are um, coming up with ways of doing three things. Taking what it is that we're actually, is the, uh, the way the, the, the device is being used, capturing that data, how we interact with the device, which is different. This is sort of the cybersecurity, um, how you hold the device, um, does that define who you are? Can you find that someone's different than others? Um, and uh, thinking about that. And also using the sensors. So this, this concept of um, building up things, um, such as the research data apps, su such as other things, um, are um, being done to be able to enable navigation. I'm going to give a couple of examples of what I think are things that, that are now known that you can do. Um, we built a Parkinson app. It was called Empower. That Parkinson app, um, in three days, uh, got into the hands of about, or at least in the, in the early weeks, got into the hands of tens of thousands of Parkinson patients, many of whom followed it up for a uh, year plus. And uh, we could follow gait, we could follow tremor, we could follow voice, et cetera. And when we looked at the data, a um, couple of interesting things came out of it. One was that if you follow a single individual, 120 days, and you looked pre-post medication, and you're looking at one of the attributes here, the single individual, 120 days, and what you'd see is that actually they had good days and bad days. They had some days where if you were to say, is the drug working? It's not working. They had some days where it's working a lot. And it was the fluctuation in this uh, sort of ebb and flow of what was going on there. And with that, we put out a little tag question, hey, um, tell us if you think there's a reason why this is happening. And what we got back was more interesting, which is what they would say is, um, it's what's been going on in my life that's changing my symptom. So they would say, uh, someone, uh, my, my neighbor moved away, or I moved into a new house, or I got a cat. All these things which as a clinician I would go, uh, these are sort of anecdotes. Let's get back and talk about your disease. The interesting thing is what is it in the world that's actually making that disease come and go in that fluctuation? And that gives, right, that should, I right, put a little bell on our head that maybe there are things that people could do that actually would impact the, the disease even though it's at this stage or that stage. So it, 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 so it got us interested even more than in the intra-individual variation in the sort of the, the way people are shaping their disease, although they don't recognize it, they don't see it. The other component was that if you take a set of individuals, this is 30, and you rank order them for something like caps, and then you look at different attributes, you might think that they would uh, uh, move together. But look at the variation between same individuals, rank order on the top for gait speed, balance, and, and voice frequency, and you'll see that that disease is expressing itself in those individuals in very different ways. So the fun one that I don't have is, and show me that with time. But, but it talks about the underlying pathology. And, and this is um, just you know, thought to be changes in dopamine and what's going on in, in, the, in the brain. Um, there's been some beautiful work that has gone on in terms of trying to capture information in digital phenotyping. 
Some of the best work uh, came out of Ginger IO before it turned into a digital counseling company. So it decided I can make more money doing digital counseling and it shift off. But they have some really good longitudinal records. I think the, one of the best companies that is currently active is uh, my uh, colleague friend, uh, Tom Hinsel, is running a group uh, uh, out of California called MindStrong, where they're looking at depression and they are looking at how to follow patients in these multimodal ways um, by seeing if they can predict shifts uh, in, 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 in moves. So th there's, there's, there's some data beginning to come. Um, in, the, in the fall, you may have seen this paper on Instagram, they said, can we look through all the photos and can we predict who's going to, or who, who has, it wasn't predicting, who has what type of depression? And, and of all the features that they could use, the one that stood out, which I think was pretty cool, was whether or not someone was using filter. It wasn't whether they were um, taking pictures, it wasn't other things, it was whether they decided to, to, to fix up their picture or not. <laughs> Almost like when they were depressed, they just didn't care. And it didn't take that effort to sort of do that. So th there is some work that's been going on along those lines. Um, but what, what this uh, project, what this, uh, what I've been thinking about is, are there endemic risks that actually could be worked on in this emerging uh, digital phenotyping uh, uh, world? Um, so um, of those you know, 10,000 apps that, that are out there, are there things that are the allure of high top technology, yet again, sort of like, you know, beckoning us without stepping back and thinking of really what do you need to know in order to be able to make use out of that, uh, um, out of these, uh, these apps, how they're used. And um, I want to break it into two parts. Um, one is, um, are there some things that we should be putting time into trying to understand about assessments? Uh, how, what, how those are done, and similar, uh, I want to uh, put some time into, let's say you can generate information, um, are people ready to work with that information? How, how might we use our devices to come up with ways to allow people to be able to, to use that, that information better? So uh, on the assessment goals, if you go to most uh, uh, large, small companies, they'll have things where they say, we're uh, able to collect singular multimodal data streams. Um, we're very careful to anchoring it to the existing standards. Um, we work to validate that the device approaches uh, match the existing those standards, and the use uh, device approaches um, can guide existing therapy. So what I'm saying is these are you know, four boxes that almost every company works hard. You go, I can do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. Therefore, I have a good app, right? Yay! Um, uh, let, let's move forward. Why do we assume that symptoms are the currency by which we measure the uh, presence or the shift in, in disease? Um, we do because they are a component of complications, but the tools that we use to be able to follow patients are framed constrained by the technologies that we have at hand that allow us to assess those patients. So most of the symptoms that are uh, listed, whether it's for some neurologic or immunologic, if you look at you know, the description of the disease, that description is bounded by the technology that allows you to assess this or that. Could it be that actually there are signals that emanate from us that actually are precursors to those symptoms? They haven't reached the status where you can pick it up on the stethoscope, you can pick it up that way. But actually, it, it, it should be looking for signals that emanate from people and trying to make sense of their presence and how they might be used to, to sort of follow a transition state uh, predicted that, that are there. Um, the, most of the apps out there um, are quite comfortable um, saying, I am, my goal is to determine whether this patient has this type of disease or that. So it's on the diagnosis side. Um, prediction would be much better. Um, who says that the standards are the best anchors? Um, that is basically um, saying that um, the therapies that exist are the ones that we need to, to recognize. And the reason why I'm uh, particularly uh, um, concerned about this is the, the things that might be able to help people navigate between health and disease could be all those things before you drop the pill, or once you drop the pill. Right? So, so if you're you're not thinking of how to do that, and then last, as I was mentioning, 
Um, if you say, I'm going to put you in this bin or that bin, the aggregation to the mean often smothers this elegant longitudinal granular data that it seems like it would be great to be able to unpack. On the health suggestions, um, again, most of the people um, actually, if you talk to researchers, I sometimes get the sense of what they want is to use the app to collect data. I, I, I hear, this is a great app that will allow us to collect data. That is true, but if you look at impact, it would be nice if it does something other than collect data. Um, or, uh, if not that, I think it's, it makes the assumption that the physician is the go-to uh, component and that it's trying to influence the physician and that's what, what matters. Um, and, and even in the situation where you want to give it back to the individual, so like give them back data so they're going to be able to use it. Um, but as I'll talk about later, as artificial intelligence uh, begins to replace the doctor, so the parochial AI um, gets replaced by the central AI, I think there's a chance that that could be used either in an autonomous way where you don't even know what it's doing, or you could use that to give agency and augment what is actually the person is going through and allow them. So I think uh, what, what, what we're interested in asking is how could you um, find ways to augment that way that an individual could, could, could make decisions instead of transferring that from the parochial AI over to the, to, to the doctor. Um, and um, the, you know, who, who says anyone's gonna pay attention to, 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 to what we ask them to do? Um, denial is probably one of the biggest risk factors for, for getting disease. Um, again, whether it's uh, myself or others, most of the things that we do that we shouldn't do, um, we have found extremely convenient ways to uh, keep from acknowledging that we're doing those things or, or not paying attention to things. And, and I think we have to, to, to work on that. Um, I think there's an opportunity to decide whether that work gets done on the subconscious or the conscious level in terms of that, that mind work. But what we're really uh, trying to figure out is imagine this is a contour map that you can draw um, whether you ate three cheeseburgers or ran three miles. And it'd be nice to be able to get to a place where there's a proximal way of saying, for that person, this is what is, is likely to happen. I think um, uh, it, that, that I think has a chance to be uh, motivational. So um, I think I sort of gave this slide already, which is you know, parochial AI machines have this uh, ability to, to give insights. We get them from the physician. I think that's going to, uh, uh, in many respects, soon get replaced by pooling that data in, in good ways. But who is looking out for whom and why? And I think this question of being able to lower the overall um, average weight of a Canadian by 10 pounds will become uh, quite possible to do without telling anyone anything indirectly. And I'm sort of interested in trying to find a way of whether it's possible to do it in, in a less invisible way and then put agency back in the form of why, why can't we work on, on, on that also? So um, it's there. So this is a, a proposal that is uh, early in terms of uh, too much time in the micro <laughs> bubble of uh, thinking about it, um, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, we can go somewhere with it. But it'd be nice to build a personal health assistant um, that allows you to understand yourself, that allows self-navigation, notice now before and after symptoms arise, that provides a freedom to act uh, with more certainty, that nurtures actions in times of strength. And um, I think to do this, it actually is going to take building a community where people say, I want to help this person, this person can help me. Um, as I'll show later, the ability to find those who are in their course of disease and actually learn from where they went on their course of disease and who's most like you requires an active component of this that isn't just, let's just collect all this data from people and we don't need to talk to them at all and we'll be able to come back and, and give good answers. I think it is, is, uh, is hard. The other point is, you could say that what you were trying to do was build some big uh, map of disease that, that lets you know where um, uh, all the sub-branches of, of a particular disease were going. I think that's a really hard uh, project. The question is, can we build a way to know whether you should turn right or turn left? Can, can we get down to something where what we really want to know is, can we show that we can be predictive for an individual? Can we show that we build a system that allows you to know if you do this um, proximal 
relative action, do this or that, you know, for what, for how do you build that data? How do you show that that's possible um, to, to do? So there are three um, themes for the uh, fundamental questions about assessments and three about suggestions. Um, almost all of medicine uh, requires a, uh, or uh, lives off of one-dimensional, uh, uh, one-directional maps. So if you uh, go up and you look up the <coughs> diabetes or you look up um, Alzheimer's, you'll have this, this is the prodromal stage, this is the early, this is the mid, and the late. And we follow patients who go this to this to that. Um, the chance that actually, if you had tools that would allow you to see the, uh, what's really going on in individuals, um, it's very likely that you could begin to actually build some map <coughs> of what that trajectory for individuals is that isn't just along one axis. So, so what is it that actually that would look like? Can, can we show that actually whether it's something like type 1 diabetes or whether it's something like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, can we, can we show that actually um, there's this branching structure? Remembering the pharmaceutical companies are not interested in knowing that. What they're interested in knowing is, can I give a drug to a large set of patients, uh, as many as possible, that could add some, some benefits? So there hasn't been much of an incentive to build that branch of production. Um, evidence for actions that modify the disease. Um, if you go to the literature and you ask, um, where is the data that this or that can impact a, a disease, and you get down into the real evidence, it takes a long time, it's, it's uh, not very good. And I think one of the things we have to ask is, what are the types of actions that we can show um, beyond um, modifying diseases, uh, or I'm sorry, um, modifying symptoms actually modify diseases? And uh, back to what I was saying earlier, uh, what signals emanate from us preceding disease transitions and actually after disease transitions? I think it's pretty likely that that uh, sort of transition to saying, okay, this person has this symptom is in part uh, because they had some ebb and flow leading into the transition, but after the transition, um, there's a good chance that actually it's not solidly at type one level as we showed. Um, on the questions about suggestions, uh, devices in the realm of protecting versus entertainment. Things like most of the work being done by, on devices is, has a, um, economics has a uh, sort of direction of use that is primarily to entertain us, and I think it's uh, worth trying to figure out how and devices uh, can be better used to protect us. Um, the ability of apps to enable sharing insights and data um, seems a worth looking at. And then this concept of um, limits to our devices enabling individuals to use. If you talk to anyone who's been studying patients with the diseases, um, this is issue of motivation, this issue of how do you get someone to change, uh, how do you do, is some people have been spending a you know, long time thinking about behavioral uh, economics and to naively come in and go, oh, on a device, we'll be able to do that is, is really uh, totally inappropriate. So I think the question is, is there anything about devices, about proximity, about how they uh, could give data back that gives you any uh, chance of being able to do something better than is currently not working very well in terms of getting uh, people, uh, people motivated? Um, so the, the idea was, um, take it on as a, as a research uh, project and say, instead of picking a disease because it is large in the population or um, uh, some, some component of, of trying to make a product, could you find the conditions that actually would allow you to best solve the questions around how to do assessments and uh, how to do suggestions? Could you uh, find conditions that had certain attributes and then work on those conditions that gave you the chance to have the most insight. So uh, it would be helpful to have frequent, rapid transitions. Uh, it would be good to come and come back to a starting state. Uh, we'd like to tie it to existing clinicians that it's a lot cheaper. If you have something where someone's already um, needing to go into a doctor and then paying for that. Um, not encumbered by other uh, conditions. Um, and uh, in general, relatively young patients. And uh, uh, particularly on, uh, uh, engagement, um, uh, females more likely to have some element of uh, willingness to share and, and engage. And so we, we looked at those and said that there are actually two conditions um, that had multiple symptoms that fit that way um, and that if we had a way to do all day sensing and, and record, actually 
Uh, let me just tell you what those are, uh, <laughs> which is um, pregnancy and uh, cancer patients getting chemotherapy. And so there end up being a uh, half dozen or more symptoms that are probably signals that turn into symptoms that turn into complications in each. And there's an interesting overlap between those uh, two conditions. So that, that is uh, what we've uh, chosen to do. Um, the how to do it, the ability to use our devices to pull off uh, what's going on in the device, how you're interacting with the device and the sensors uh, is something that's pretty straightforward to do. Um, one of the things that we have toyed with is is the transition from the edges that make up the signals that turn into the symptoms that turn into the complications have a continuity that is similar enough to the continuity that is there in the physical world for analyzing images that some of the advances in using deep learning that have ways of building up um, what it is that um, uh, was used to parse um, uh, whether something is or is not something. Um, could be, uh, are, is there a chance that these uh, low level, mid level, um, high level features actually exist when we go to uh, medical conditions? And what are those edges? What would those look like? Um, how do they map to uh, symptoms and optic conditions? And this is uh, um, based off of some of the stuff that, that you may know about that uh, um, many people are associated with. Um, that it actually can be done in health. There's some, some nice examples. Again, this fall, um, iRhythm and Andrew Ng at Stanford did a nice study um, that uh, some of it led to this FDA approved device that we go all the way through, um, which was um, looking at large numbers of patients with EKG readings and seeing whether, in fact, you could uh, build a way of classifying um, different types of uh, arrhythmias. Um, they used a 34 layer, it's a matter of number, but a 34 layer convolutional neural network. The thing that was interesting was that um, cardiologists are really good at doing this. It's like 98% effective. This was better than, than that. It was as good and better than those cardiologists at, at being able to uh, make those uh, predictions from compositional layers. Um, a number of people have been working on various aspects of outlier detection. This is some work um, that uh, uh, Milos Hoschrick at, at uh, Pittsburgh uh, did, where they took HR records, um, uh, several uh, thousand of them, post-surgical cardiac patients, and wanted to know whether they could actually build detectors that someone um, was likely to need to return to the clinic. So there's a paper that took those records tried to build up some uh, vector space that included uh, almost 10,000 uh, generated features, a bunch of labs and, and medications. And um, in this instance, I noticed there were favorable alert rates uh, compared with the existing clinical. So I'm not gonna say they, they did as well as um, the EKG analysis, but there are people who are sort of working in this space, and I think uh, that's an example. I mentioned this power of um, trying to get the way someone is interacting with their devices as a data stream and um, recognizing the way we hold our device if we're in pain or if uh, cognitive issues are there. Um, the way we engage our devices um, should be able to be uh, uh, picked up and, and trying to find doppelgangers, trying to find the people in that uh, medical uh, so space between health and disease that were most on a, on a contour that were like us um, and, and being able to use their journey as a way to say I need some more power and I can have some sense of, of, uh, of where we're going. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, on, the, on the behavioral suggestion, a lot of things we could put in, but uh, we've been uh, uh, sort of uh, we've been impressed with the group at MIT, uh, Ross Picard's lab, where for the behavioral work, what they uh, said was, who knows what will work for a given individual and over time, let's just start collecting and making an encyclopedia of those times when this led to that, just to build a, a, a set of knowns about what types of behavior could ha uh, uh, interventions could build to that. So we don't have a vocabulary, we don't have a place to go in you know, these big cohort studies. Do we actually go on a one-by-one, one, you know, paired individuals helping each other? 
And uh, this paper, again, came out last year on, on that. So, so I put it all together, and the real question is, what you almost are saying you want is some health exploratorium, where you try to figure out um, where is there enough space to be able to make uh, some insights. Um, you try to build it out. Um, but the most important thing is the you is not just a single individual or an institute. institute. It's actually, can we make it so individuals are actually interested? Uh, can you build a community um, that's interested in protection and working with each other where helping each other is actually part of that, uh, that building? What would it take to, uh, to, to do that? So um, the, the components to pull off something like this is um, finding a bunch of experts that usually don't uh, cohabitate. Um, uh, people who know how to build the clinicians and the, who have the cohorts, uh, people know how to code up the device and apps, um, uh, the data flow is extremely important, and then the people who um, are the people who really know how to look at, look at deep learning and machine learning to make the assessments, and those that are trying to do the suggestions. So, in thinking of how, how do you pull that off, um, the cluster of symptoms I was referring to should look familiar. Um, it's not as if these are the only symptoms that come up in the pregnancy that lead to complication. There are many others. I was a uh, practicing uh, oncologist for a while. There are others. But point is, it's sort of interesting to think of this uh, a set of uh, six or seven symptoms and ask, could we find those uh, signals that turn into those transition states um, when they come back down? Um, could we um, uh, have cohorts where we, we work on these assessments? And, and, and suggestions. Um, uh, so not on one symptom. A lot of people say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take on hyperglycemia, or I'm gonna take on blood pressure. So allow the data and, and get a sense of which ones are easier or harder to do. Um, I've talked about the fact that there's a group that sort of can work on assessments and guidance without doing the, the thing that most groups do, which is once we know they've got the, once we know the assessments we can make, then we're gonna figure out what to tell the patient. So I think there are fundamental issues of guidance and assessments that can allow you to work on both of those problems before you put those uh, together. And so if you go, what the heck are you talking about? This is what Al Edwards at SGC would say, right? A lot of mumbo jumbo now. What the heck are you saying? Um, um, it requires getting data feeds off the devices and clinical records, finding out which is the robust data, looking to see whether, how robust is the signal in general? Um, like, well, well, what is it that you're pulling off? And a side breath that's important is that there are certain times during the day where you're doing something that's repetitive or routine. Instead of using an active test where you request someone to do something, if you can find a time where they're a third into their drive uh, in the morning or this or that, and you find those times, it's likely that those are enriched times to harvest the signals that, that might be uh, valuable. So we'd like to test what are those routines? What, what, what are the times? Or the act, uh, activities that one might be able to harvest from, and then start asking. So, can I can I just uh, show that a transition state has occurred? And then, when I know I can find the transition state, can I make uh, uh, insights into predicting that that transition would, uh, state would occur? And then the other is, this is not going to work in uh, in uh, everyone in the same way. So, I think the most important end part of that sort of first block of work is. Um, what fraction of the people does it work well? Is it uh, homogeneous or not? And what symptom that you're trying to assess in this way? Maybe some symptoms you actually go, aha, I can do this, but I can't do that. So you, you let the grid come out and go, this is pretty good for these people or not. And, and hopefully then you put it in the public domain, you let anyone use that to work on it and, and sort of help people who are trying to, to build their products. Um, if you want to know the type of grid that you have to do is you go through and look at your devices, Look at the data that you're able to pull off the devices and you map them. What am I going to use to look at cognition or mood or sleep or gait or fatigue? And you can build these maps. And your goal is to have multiple data streams in and see which ones of those are most uh, uh, valuable to, to pull together. One of the suggestions, uh, uh, the types of things we've been thinking about is um, how do you build out a playful space where someone will um, declare, self-declare where they are in the health of knowing uh, to do three things. Uh, people spin things up in their heads and dream up odd things. You'd like to unwind those. You'd like to have people be able to assimilate things that are knowns, and you'd like them to accept some of the unknowns. And 
part of this is trying to figure out well, what do you, what can you do to, to help you uh, do that? And in particular, on those axes between anxious and confident, denial and motivated, naive and expert, and these are not immutable, these are just examples of the type of, uh, of, uh, sort of um, uh, dimensions to look at. Can we actually assess where someone is? Is it possible to assess this person's in this uh, place or that? And how do we nurture that return to agency? Is it something where they need to do something and just pause with themselves? Are we so um, you know, uh, driven in our days that we don't pause enough to be able to act on things that we should? Um, is it group support peer to peer? Is it leaning on experts? And so I think uh, trying some of those, prototyping that out um, is, is important. And so for like the pausing with the self, there's hardware that would allow you to experience uh, others' uh, own uh, presence. Um, there, there, there's software to, to create ways to uh, sort of have quiet spaces um, to, to be able to do that pausing. Um, group support, again, hardware, software, expert support, um, ways to, to, to pull in those experts that, as, as you need. So the, the idea is to um, not try to start some new brick and mortars thing, but to um, find the leaders that exist in each one of those components, leave them where they are at their institutions, see if they're willing to, to, to come onto a project team, and then have funders that are willing to, um, to, to pull that together. Um, and, you know, how are we going to escape from where we are? So just I'm going to leave this up for the, for the questions, um, which is, um, you know, it'd be nice if we could make individual assessments for proximal actions. Um, it'd be nice to find adjacent individuals uh, whose trajectories uh, can inform us. It'd be nice if we could learn how to nurture individuals sharing their data and insights. And uh, it'd be nice if we could provide ways for people to assimilate and act on their individual assessments. Um, thanks very much.